The hearing session is now open. It forms part of the examination of the Waverley Local Plan Part 2. My name is GJ Fort and I'm the inspector appointed by the Secretary of State to conduct the examination and to report to the Council in due course. As ever, the format of the hearing is a focused and structured discussion that I shall lead. So if I could ask um, the members of the Council's team to introduce themselves, please. Good morning, sir. Wayne Beglan of Council, Council for the Local Planning Authority. And with me today, I have Mr. Ellis and Dr. Riley. Thank you. A reminder that uh, the programme officer for the examination is a whole of Charlotte Glancy, who should be um, the main point of contact prior to and after the hearing sessions and should be copied into all correspondence. I'm joined by Chris Banks today, who will be um, offering programme officer support for this session. Um, and Chris is going to give us our usual uh, housekeeping remarks. Right, I'm sure you all know this, but uh, here in the, in, the, in the event of a fire um, or other serious incident, the alarm in this building is a siren. If alarms are inoperative or inadvisable in a bomb emergency, the instruction to leave will be given by word of mouth. If the alarm sounds, leave by the nearest safe fire exit. Please note the position of fire exits from this room. Uh, do not stop to rec uh, reclaim personal effects. Do not use the lift. Proceed to the assembly point. This is located during daytime until 18.30 at the far end of the Berries playing field opposite the council offices uh, and after 18.30 Waitrose Car Park. Um, and uh, it, you can't re-enter the building until it's safe to do so. Thank you. Thank you. So the hearings are being filmed and live streamed. Is everyone present comfortable with that? The matters to be discussed today will be focused questions based upon and taking forward the matters, issues and questions and associated written statements received. I am tasked with considering the soundness of the plan in accordance with the criteria of the national planning policy framework and also whether it is legally compliant. The hearings are intended to assist me in that regard. In submitting the plan, the council considers that it's sound, and this is a starting point for the examination. So those challenging the soundness of the plan have to explain why and what changes might be necessary that will make it sound. In order to test the plan for soundness and legal compliance, I will need to ask questions. So you will have seen that I've already been doing this in preliminary questions, in the published MIQ documents and in earlier hearing sessions. And both the council and other participants have responded to these. The questions will continue today. However, anything that is asked should not be taken as demonstrating a particular predisposition on my part. I will normally start a particular topic by asking the council for responses to questions I have before indicating I wish others to comment. It's open for the council to propose further changes to the plan. And I would ask that they keep a record of possible changes that arise during the discussions. Any changes that would constitute main modifications would be subject to future consultation. The examination remains open until my report is submitted to the council However, no further representations or evidence will be accepted after the hearing sessions have finished unless I specifically request otherwise. Moreover, I'm not expecting any further written submissions during the course of the hearing sessions, but I may request further material should discuss discussions indicate that that will be useful. As ever, there'll be a short session at the end of today to ensure that any suggested modifications or other pieces of work have been adequately recorded. So if we can now uh, move on to the substantive matter under discussion today, which is matter five. 
So by way of introduction to issue one uh, of this matter, I invite the Council to outline their view as to whether the LPP2 sets out an effective and justified suite of policies to protect and enhance designated sites with reference to the statement of common ground with natural England where relevant. And it will also be helpful to me if you could highlight any main modifications that have been suggested to address these matters and what soundness uh, issues that they are intended to deal with. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The strategic policies um, for biodiversity are um, set out in um, Local Plan Part 1, specifically under the Natural Environment Policies Chapter. They're policies NE1, NE2, and NE3. But those also make up components of parts of policies for landscape, character, townscape, and design. Local Plan Part 2 is providing the detail to those strategic policies, particularly through DM1, which sets out the approach to managing the environmental implications of development. However, protecting biodiversity is an important part of development management policies on creating new or changing the public realm, trees and landscape, and to protect specific landscape designations. In terms of specific allocations, there is a requirement to mitigate the impact of development from these allocations in the plan where it's been assessed that, though, that the development is likely to have an adverse effect on, those, on the areas that have been designated to protect the biodiversity. This approach has been agreed by Natural England through a statement of common ground. The Council is proposing some main modifications, however, to policy DM1G to reflect the provisions of the Environment Act for new development to deliver at least 10% biodiversity net gain and to manage light pollution on nature conservation, which is under MM47. It also proposes a main modification to policy DM1A to ensure that the mitigation hierarchy is consistent with national policy, and that's MM3. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so moving on and moving on from the, the material I've, I've received in um, hearing statements and in the statement of common ground and starting off with the, um, the hindhead concept area. So as I understand it from those documents, the, the sort of cap capacity for residential growth within that area will be met uh, by the expected yield on the DS or two allocation is that correct yes sir that's the central hindhead um allocation which I believe would take up the residual that's been left from the outstanding permissions and completions within that area thank you and, and the mitigation measures for that site are, are set out in the avoidance strategy <laughs> Yes, sir, that's also correct. The, the Hindhead um, Avoidance Strategy, which is um, document CD248, does set out the mitigation me measures were deemed acceptable to um, for the development within the Hindhead Concepts area. Thanks. So could, could you remind me of uh, Natural England's position on on the hindhead concept area in general and the avoidance strategy in particular? So my position with Natural England is that they think it's appropriate for the 100 dwellings which they which was set out in the hindhead concept area that was anticipated to come forward as a result of the, uh, um, the, the hindhead tunnel, um, provided that within that number or up to that number would be acceptable. But any development beyond that is not acceptable within that 400 meters of the of the SPA. Okay, turning 
uh, more generally to the available options for um, heathland infrastructure projects or um, suitable alternative natural green space. So this is hips and sang um, to give them their, their shorter titles. So they're, they're set out in um, your matter six statement. So firstly, there, there's, there's a reference to a call for sites exercise in relation to HIPS as a potential option. And this, this has been um, something that's been pursued in East Hampshire. So do you have any view on to what extent that has yielded uh, sites thus far? Is this one for Dr. Riley, perhaps? Uh, yes, the, the East Hampshire one hasn't been published yet, but yes, it has yielded uh, a number of sites, I think about half a dozen sites, uh, which is obviously to meet their need. That's all they've been looking at for the time being uh, in that area. So yes, it has yielded sites. And, and in terms of where it talks about a potential, well, there's a potential for Waverley to do this is an exercise on its own or a potential to do it as a joint exercise with East Hans. Is there any, has there any, has there been any work with East Hans in terms of that joint exercise yet? So we, we regularly meet with East, with East Hampshire. And in fact, we do discuss these particular um, matters as regard to a joint approach. Nothing has been um, set out as, as yet. Um, but the intention is to carry on discussions with East Hampshire as to see an approach that we can take take together and as well with the South Downs National Park Authority. So it, it, it's fair to say it's a, a conceptual stage at the minute that there's nothing fully worked up, but nevertheless, as an option, that's something that Natural England are, are comfortable with. Yes, Natural England are comfortable. They are they are a part of the meetings in, in, in many cases. So it's something that they're they're endorsing the approach that we wish to take. But you're you're quite right, it hasn't been worked up as yet. So I, I just wonder whether I could elaborate on that. Um I thought this you know is, is potentially a useful thing to, to sort of set out. We did cover this point about degrees of certainty to some degree on Tuesday, um, but I thought it would be useful to draw your attention to um, a particular case where this was discussed with regard to the Newick neighbourhood plan, um, which is uh, DLA delivery versus Lewitt's district council and Newick parish council, case C1, 2015, 3025, or the judgment from the Court of Appeal was handed down in 2017. And the point of me citing that case is that uh, this was an instance where um, the need for SANG was identified um, in the local plan part one and was identified in the Newick uh, neighborhood plan, but no location for SANG was identified at that time the plan was made, uh, nor was anything discussed in, in, in there. Uh, and the basis for the appeal was, was uh, but yes, the basis of the appeal of, again, the uh, making of the plan was basically on that point. And in particular, I drew your attention to paragraphs 47 to 49, where the appeal court judges, first of all, drew a, a very clear distinction between the level of detail that's needed for a planning process, a plan making process, I beg your pardon, and that for a planning application decision. This was something that I also cited some other case law from the EU and from the UK on Tuesday about. Uh, so the distinct difference in tests that is required. Um, they also took account of the fact that although a specific land parcel for a sign had not been identified in the plan or at the time the plan was made, it was clear that the council and the examiner, uh, in other words, their version of the inspector, understood the need for mitigation, understood what the mitigation was going to need to involve, and understood that the council were working towards the provision of sang. Those are the words that are used in the um, judgment. The judges then noted it was open to the examiner to conclude as a matter of planning judgment that the requisite sangs would be provided during the plan period and that throughout the period of the NNP, the neighbourhood plan, the SPA and SAC would therefore be safeguarded against any significant effects 
even though no actual sang parcels had been identified at that time. The judge also concluded that at the plan preparation stage, it was perhaps inevitable and anyway not surprising that the location of the sang and the timing of their provision should still be uncertain. Such uncertainty might well have been an obstacle to a grant of planning permission for a proposed development of housing, but it was not an obstacle to allocations for housing development being made in the neighbourhood plan. And I think the context of that obviously is that in this case, the, the council's intended approach is for the developer for the Royal Junior School to, to identify their own stand. They have not yet identified a sign for their allocation, but there is clear policy in both LPP1 and LPP2 that requires them to do so and would prohibit consent being granted until a location for SANG was identified. Moreover, aside from things the developer will devise, the council has begun exploring the range of potential mitigation options and locations of their own account, which were discussed in our matter six statement, which you were just alluding to, and which are all agreed as being suitable in principle by Natural England as reflected in the statement of common ground. Now, clearly all of those options will require a greater, lesser or lesser degree of further work if they are to be brought forward. But that's not surprising since it is the council's intention for the developer to bring forward their own solution. And it is why numerous possibilities have been identified for investigation, both by the council alone and as we've mentioned in, in, with East Hampshire District Council, who are looking into similar matters for their, they are planning their local plan, their new local plan part one, basically, which is the context of what they're doing. Um, there are also further options that haven't been specifically listed. This is not something that the council has identified as, as an intention, but I, I put it in there anyway. I, in the case I just referred to, the Newick case, reference was made to the possibility of compulsory purchase of land for SANG. Uh, I'm not suggesting waiver of considering that, but it is something that was floated in that discussion. Some tenants based in Heath authorities, like Surrey Heath Council, are far more constrained than Waverley or Hazelmere, if you prefer, um, but they are still able to find and are still being able to find solutions to the same need for tenants based in Heath, either themselves or in liaison with adjacent local authorities like Ilford. So the key point is there is no reason to believe that it will be literally impossible to deliver a Sang at Hazelmere during the remaining years of the plan period. And the fact that a land parcel has not yet been confirmed does not mean the European site is not protected and does not mean an allocation cannot be made. And I think the Newick case uh, the, the opinion of the judges in the Newick case sets a context for that. So I just thought it was useful and helpful potentially to provide that setting. Thank you. Thank you. It'd be helpful to me if that judgment could be added to the library as well, please. So, so in terms of, of the options that are in the, um, the matter six statement, is, is it, the council's intention that they're going to be captured more formally somewhere. I think, I think in terms of the council owned sites and the potential call for sites um, process, um, rather than perhaps the, the land that's in control of Redwood, because we've heard that's, that's tied into um, proposals that are emerging for that site. Um, in, in terms of how would the plan give effect to that mitigatory strategy? Would it, would it be justificatory text or supporting text in the plan? Or would it be a future SPD that outlines these sorts of things? I just wonder whether the council's given any thought to that. To be honest, I haven't given it matters of thought. Um, the position was that we didn't think it was something that needed to be specifically in the plan um, for the reasons that um, uh, Dr. Riley has explained that it, you know, the certainty is in the plan already that that mitigation is required um, and, and specific wording in the development allocations in themselves that, that it's required. Um, the position is that we haven't looked at all the options and worked them all out as, as I think suggested. Um, and as such, when we have advanced work, the council will be looking at a document that we think is appropriate to give more certainty about how we would then move that work on. Say, so that's my initial thoughts at the moment. <laughs> Mm 
And so, so just adding on to that, in terms of the tests of soundness, for the reasons that Dr. Riley and Mr. Ellis have given, I think we would say that the existing policies and text are sufficient for meeting the tests of soundness that you need to apply. Um, beyond that, of course, the explanatory text can be used for purposes of explaining how the policies can operate, and explanatory text can also be used simply for informative purposes, and that's a residual category of information. Um, and, and it may be that you are of the view that it would be useful just for there to be some additional signposting, as it were, in the text of the local plan uh, within that third category of information. And, and so if, if that it is all becomes your provisional view about things, then certainly we can um, consider whether or not some additional passages signposting would help. But in terms of whether or not they would be necessary by way of main modifications, our submission would be that we think we've done enough on these particular issues. Yeah, I'm just thinking in terms of uh, Paragraph 16D of the framework. So a plan should contain policies that are clearly written and unambiguous. So it is evident how a decision maker should react to development proposals. Um, I'm just wondering whether additional text might assist in that regard. Mr. Beglin, have you got any views on that? So I, I think really for the reasons that, that Dr. Riley has given the policy implications of developers not being able to come forward and satisfy the current requirements of the policy are clear. They won't be able to get their, their planning permission over the line at the end of the day. Um, but again, if you think that we ought to be making that more explicit or providing further guidance, and it's certainly something we can take away and, and see if we can um, provide something that, that that makes the position uh, clearer in that respect. Yeah, I was just going to add um, the, the the sites that require mitigate in terms of informing the decision maker, so the decision maker knows what they need to do and what they require. The sites that require mitigation are clearly spelled out. The, the policies in both LPP1 and LPP2, uh, for example, with the Royal Junior School site, there's obviously the explicit discussion in there of the need to provide mitigation for that site are clearly identified and also Further to the work that was on LPP1, we now have the thresholds for mitigation or the, and the type of mitigation they trigger that has been agreed with Natural England as well. And the concept of SANG, for example, is well understood. The concept of Heath and infrastructure projects is relatively well understood from the Dorset Heath system running for years, etc. Um, possibly the, the thresholds could be more clearly spelled out in the plan. I, I'm not immediately familiar with how they are, so that might be something that could be brought into it through a main mod. But I think what the decision maker needs to do and what they need to know uh, is fairly clear in the information that's already available. I mean, this, this is potentially one where pre-application discussion is going to be important, isn't it? Uh, and the framework talks about the importance of effective pre-application process. Um, so I, th I think I'd, I'll reflect on that. If you could reflect on it as well, in, in terms of that, you know, the decision making and the, the development control element. Of it. And so that, that may be a very helpful lens to look at it through, actually, the, the, the pre-application stage to see what further advice might be uh, made clear from the plan to those who are making, uh, proposing to make applications in the future. Thank you. Mr. Kai, any views on the material that's been submitted in um, particularly the mitigation options in the, the matter six statement? Uh, yes, sir. Um, firstly, apologies for my, my, my late arrival. Um, if I might uh, first sir, just um, respond to uh, the, the point that Dr. Riley has just made and the, the, the case law that he refers to. I, I don't disagree with him that it is entirely possible to look at the circumstances and reach a view that there's adequate certainty that um, SANG and or mitigation is going to come forward. But I think the circumstances are, of that case were different in terms of the level of housing provision, um, the number of sites, um, the opportunities for, um, for mitigation to be brought forward. I think we need to make this the judgment here pertaining to the facts of, of this case and, and, and this plan. 
um, with, with that in, in mind, I think it's the case that um, where, where the plan needs bolstering is that there hasn't been, um, in my view, adequate recognition of the fact that there's been a change in circumstances between LPP1 uh, and LPP2, Local Plan Part 2. Um, I can illustrate that partly with reference to paragraphs uh, 3.7 and 3.8 of the um, LPP2 Addendum HRA, that's LPP2 CD109, uh, which set out what I'm sure you're already familiar with, sir, that Natural England's position on the need for mitigation has changed between LPP1 and LPP2, and they are now seeking mitigation in some circumstances in the form of HIPS or, or, or SANG for the larger sites. Um, I'd just highlight that I think the plan hasn't, had, hasn't adequately ad addressed that with reference to uh, tables, table one on page seven of that document and table two on page nine. So those are the tables that um, effectively set the context, context and summarise the level of existing uh, baseline pressure on the Weald and Heaths in terms of the amount of residential development um, that, that is around that SPA, effectively comparing it to other similar SPAs elsewhere and noting that, that the level of pressure is it is very much lower. Now, if you compare the data in those two tables to this, um, the HRA for LPP1, so those are tables uh, 10 on page 45 of that HRA and tables 11 on page 46, the data is exactly the same. It hasn't been updated despite the passage of years and the sort of incremental increase in, rec in residential development ar around that SBA. So I, I, I do think that um, the situation has changed and it warrants uh, a sort of a fresh look. Um, and I think actually the council and Dr. Riley recognised that because that's evidenced in paragraphs 3.15 and paragraph 4.4 of um, the HRA for LPP2, um, where uh, it, it states in, in terms that further work is needed before this examination to, uh, to, to address that. Um, turning uh, specifically um, to the, the options that the council's um, brought forward. Oh, no, so if, if I might, um, Firstly, in terms of protecting the SPA, I can see how uh, Natural England has reached a point of, of satisfaction because there are two avenues, two routes forward for them to be able to conclude that the SPA is protected. One of those is that the council is successful or the applicants are successful and mitigation is brought forward before um, before, those, before those applications are, are det determined. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a moment. I, I have some concerns over that. But the other route or avenue to conclude that the SPA is protected is to effectively apply policy any one from local plan um, part one and um, halt the delivery of, of sites that aren't able to provide mitigation. And I think that's where our concern stems from, sir, is that we might end up in that situation where um, the delivery uh, and effectiveness of the local plan is compromised because mitigation isn't, isn't brought forward in time. Um, Dr. Riley on Tuesday uh, expressed a view that um, the, the approach thus far hasn't proven a block on housing delivery. Now, I, I, I firstly refer back to what I said a moment ago, which is that I think the position has changed from local plan part one. Um, in terms of the mitigation requirement has now increased. Um, but two other points. Um, firstly, it's not my experience as an ecologist who's been working in the area um, that um, the requirement for mitigation hasn't been a constraint. It may not have blocked any proposals, but it certainly has delayed them. I've, I've worked on at least two proposals in the Hazelman area. One of them is my, my current client at um, uh, Redwood Southwest and the Red Court site and uh, bringing forward mitigation to deliver that site, despite it being a, in the draft allocation, a, a, a draft allocation originally, um, for local plan uh, part two was, was quite a long and drawn out process and it did cause delay to, to bringing that, that site forward. Um, but looking currently, there is at least one um, application that I'm aware of locally. So that's um, application WA 2021 02876, where Natural England, this is the old Grove site. It's um, first 20 dwellings of a 40 dwelling site um, emerging through local, Waverley Local Plan Part 2, um, and they have, a, Natural England have objected to that site on the grounds that um, mitigation hasn't yet been, been brought forward. So I don't wholly accept the position that um, the need to bring forth, forward SPA mitigation isn't causing a, a, a block on housing delivery. I, I don't think that's quite right. Um, I note in the Statement of Common Ground that um, the Council has signed with Natural England um, that um, 
they've done sort of some basic calculations and worked out that if all of the remaining allocations in Hazelmere needed SANG, that would amount to something in the region of, of, of 4.6 hectares. Um, I don't see anything in that statement of common ground about um, the Royal School, which is the largest allocation for 90 dwellings. And um, I, th I think I heard Dr. Riley as I was coming in uh, explaining that the, that site is still looking for an adequate um, mitigation solution. In terms of the, op the options that have been brought forward by the council, um, they may well come to fruition, but I think there are plenty of reasons to, 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 to think that they, they, they could be delayed in delivery. So just taking them in turn, Haste Hill Common is, is registered common land, so it already has a degree of recreational activity. Uh, typically, natural England require that to be quantified through some form of visitor survey so that the ca capacity for mitigation can be discounted to account for existing use. It's registered common land, of course, which means that it, it, there will be complications to inserting the car park that the council acknowledges is required. Um, I, I think that involves land exchanges and all sorts of other complicated uh, processes. And there may also be difficulties fencing it in terms of making it safe for dogs to be let off the lead, given that it's surrounded entirely by roads. There is, it's also, um, to my knowledge, uh, an afforested common. Um, so I've, the six inch maps in the middle 1800s show it as an open common rather than a woodland. It's since deforested. Now that, that could be either good or bad. Um, it, it could mean that there are significant opportunities there for delivering ecological enhancements and a variety of different habitats when, that, when and if that site is brought forward as SANG, or it could mean that there is existing ecological sensitivity yet there um, that makes the delivery of SANG difficult, i.e. things that are sensitive to recreational pressure. And, and I, I, I don't disagree with Natural England's position that in principle that site could be brought forward, but I don't see any evidence in the documents that have been presented to the inquiry um, that dispel um, the possibility of those concerns. Um, I, don't think, I don't think any visitor survey has been done. I don't think any ecological surveys have been done Grayswood Common is much the same. The council uh, admit in their um, Math, Math 6 statement that significant more practical work is needed for that site, but it's also registered common land. It's also an afforested common. It's also bounded on one side by roads and on another side by uh, the railway. Land at Woolmer Hill Road, it wasn't entirely clear to me exactly where this land is. I didn't see any reference to a location or, or, or a map in the Matter 6 statement, I, I may have missed it. Um, if it's where I, th I think it is, um, it, 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 it is quite close to Bramshot Common to the west, which um, is ultimately uh, open land that can lead towards the SPA itself. Um, the council says in its Matter 6 statement that it appears to be considerably underused. Um, again, I'm not aware of any actual quantifiable objective evidence that that's the case in terms of visitor surveys. Um, and um, we're told that it already has parking, so it may already have a level of recreational pressure that means that significant discounting is, is required for existing use. Um, in terms of the land that's not in the council's control that's men mentioned in the Matter 6 statement, obviously um, uh, uh, my colleague on, on Tuesday mentioned uh, that, that the strategic SANG that, that, that my client has at Red Court that has been agreed in principle with Natural England that could accommodate development in Hazelmere, it won't, won't come forward unless promotion B um, of that site it, it comes forward. Um, the National Trust land that is mentioned between the Royal School site and the SPA, um, I know very little about that in honesty, sir, but it is located between, uh, as I said in the Council's Matter 6 statement, between the allocated site and the SPA. So my initial concern that would want, that uh, would warrant, I think, uh, some kind of reassurance is that people aren't going to use that site and then carry on their walk into the SPA. Um, I'm, and I'm unaware of whether or not any discussions have been had with the National Trust as to the uh, w whether or not it's realistic or in, in fact whether they'd have any interest in bringing that site forward as some form of, uh, of HIPS or, 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 or SANG. Uh, so so I, I, I think so, um, from, my, from our perspective the, the issue is that it, um, it's, it's not that Hips or SANG cannot come forward is that there has not been no evidence made available to this examination for um, stakeholders in the plan making process to, sat to look at those proposals to satisfy themselves that that's the case and to point out things that may go wrong so that they can be fixed um, before it becomes a problem for the delivery of the, of, of the local plan. And I think that's everything, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cat. You, you had some views on um, 
on-site provision at the, the Royal School site as well? Um, I, I did, sir. I mean, I, I don't wish to uh, duplicate um, the, uh, the matters that are set out in our representations. I think they, 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 they stand as they are. Uh, just to summarise them, however, it does seem to be a very constrained site in terms of its location um, adjacent to um, a busy road, which will affect um, you know, the visitor experience in any sound brought forward in that site in terms of you know, creating uh, an attractive alternative to the SPA because the SPA is a very large open air and it's possible to walk away from um, sources of noise and, and disturbance and, and artificial built infrastructure. I, I, it, appear, it seems to me that that would be very much more difficult in the Royal School site. Um, but equally, the lo as, I, as we said in more detail in, the, in our statement, uh, the Royal School site is located between two parts of the SPA um, that are large, open, easily accessible, very attractive, uh, and, and uh, one of which in particular, Bramshot and Ludshot Commons to the west, is already known to be very busy. Um, so whereas um, the, uh, the context given in the Council's HRA of LPP2 suggests that the level of recreation, existing level of recreational pressure on the SPA is very much lower than other SPAs where this is already known to be causing damage, um, Recreational pressure, of course, isn't uniformly spread across an SPA. It, it occurs in honeypots where uh, it's easier to access sites, where it's easier to park, where it's a nicer visitor experience. Uh, and my company has been involved in um, assessment work, the Bramshot and Ludshot, and the visitor surveys that are available suggest that that site is, in fact, very busy. So just because other parts of the SPA might have a very much lower level of uh, recreational pressure, it doesn't necessarily mean that damage might still be caused. Um, if an, uh, an additional level of recreational pressure is added to a site that's near its threshold uh, uh, effectively. And I suppose with, with that in mind, the other point that we've made that I think bears at least hearing out is that one of the um, results of LPP2's addendum is that there's been a reshuffling of units between allocated sites. So that although the total number of dwellings has increased, the requirement for mitigation in terms of those sites that fall into the, um, the higher categories, plus 20 and plus 30, uh, sorry, plus 20 and plus 50 units has actually decreased. So quite peculiarly, um, the cumulative level of recreational pressure that's going to be added to the SPA has increased, but the, re the likely requirement for mitigation has decreased. And that doesn't make sense to me in terms of the need for an HRA to address in combination impacts on, on the SPA. Thank you, Mr. Kite. So, any uh, responses to those points of Mr. Kite's? Um, go to Dr. Riley. Thank you. Um, I've got six points to make. Uh, there were seven, but I can't read my writing on one of the points I've written down. Um, the first point was with regard to uh, the, the level of housing and the numbers of allocated sites. Um, the level of housing and the numbers of allocated sites within local plan part two and indeed to be delivered at all around Wilton Heath phase one in Waverley is very modest by comparison to other sites that are subject to significant recreational pressure, uh, even the largest sites that are being allocated within here are within the general scheme of things if you look at terms based and anything like that are, are extremely modest. Um, it is correct that the comparison tables that we produced, uh, we did not update between LPP1 HRA and LPP2 HRA. The reason for that was because the, the point we were making with those tables still stands, uh, which is that growth, both existing and planned growth, is an order of magnitude around Thamesbase, uh, greater around Thamesbase and Heath and Dorset Heath and SPA than it is around uh, Wealden Heaths. Phase two SPA. I mean that that although obviously housing has been granted consent since then, that the broad patterns of growth and relative pressure are the same, and that relates to a point about the the fact that certain parts of the SPA will be under more recreational pressure than, than other parts of the SPA. And of course, that is true. That is true for any European site. But the way in which the condition of the European sites and their ability to achieve favorable conservation status and the ability of the birds to achieve favorable conservation status is looked at and analyzed by Natural England is as a European site as a whole. Um, in as much as if you get quiet areas and busier areas than putting it extremely crudely, the two can balance each other out. Um, the second point was with regard to the change in circumstances, just to clarify, I can't speak on behalf of Natural England, but, but just to clarify, 
the, the mitigation situation hasn't changed, rather what's happened is it's been clarified. So at the local plan part one, it was determined that because uh, White Hill Borden would be responsible for the vast majority of housing to be delivered within five kilometres of uh, Weald and Heath's phase two, which is still true, 2,725 dwellings think it is allocated there, far in excess of anything that the way we're looking to allocate. With that development mitigated, such a large percentage of the planned housing within five kilometres of that site would be addressed that the rest mopping up, if I can put it that way, the other allocations that will be coming forward um, could be dealt with on a case by case basis with the intention always to focus on the, the larger site. And, and that is set out in the approach in, in LPP1 and in the policy there. What has happened since is that Natural England have uh, added clarity to that by coming up with some thresholds uh, which did not previously exist, which is the 20 thresholds, the 50 threshold for saying etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that's a useful thing just to just to clarify that point. Um, with regard to my third point uh, as to whether or not uh, the, the, there is proven to be a block on delivery because of the fact that this mitigation for requirement in some way has been in place since at least 2016, I will defer to the council for anything further they want to say on this. My, my understanding is that there has not been a significant uh, stoppage of, of, of growth. There may be delays. Um, I can well believe there have been delays in sites coming forward, but that is the nature of the beast when you're bringing sites forward, when you're devising sang, when you're, even if you have sang land of your own, you've got to discuss various issues around it. You know, delays is not the same as not happening. We've got to bear in mind this is a, a you know, in terms of delivery of all mitigation here, this is not stuff that needs to be ready to go in the next six months. We have a plan period in front of us, which I think runs for another 10 years. And, and that's the, the strategy or process that we're looking at and the time scale we're assessing against. Um, and that brings me on to my uh, fourth point, which is I, I'm not going to go blow by blow through all the all the potential sites in the council's ownership and the various things that we put out there. Uh, as I've acknowledged, you know, there is further work to do on all of those options, um, and and you know all of them require varying degrees of further work, which includes potentially includes survey and various things that that, that, that uh, Mr. Kite mentioned there. Um, but the you know, the, the documentation that was submitted for for um, matter six was not intended to be a, a full blown ready to go saying strategy. These are the mitigation solutions that we're going with, because, of course, the, the council's approach, the approach that we're giving natural England is for individual developers to bring forward their own mitigation solutions for identifying. It would therefore be perverse, in my view, for the council to have spent a great deal of time and money, nonetheless, bringing other solutions ready to launch when that wasn't actually their, their intention to rely on them. Um, in the background, it is the intention to continue to explore those options and take those forward. And that's the context that they've been discussed with Natural England so that, so that they can be invoked uh, during the course of the plan period if they need to be so. But again, these do not need to be ready to go in the next six months or in the next 12 months. They need to be ready to go during the course of the plan period, mm -hmm. you know, in line with enabling the growth that's set out in the plan to be delivered. Um, and that's also why, for example, the, the, the land of Warmer Hill Road, there's no map of that in the Matter 6 statement. Again, the Matter 6 statement was a response to your question. It wasn't intended to be a, a full-blown uh, setting out of every single thing that we've discussed and looked at with regard to all those sites. There are obviously other things that, that are in the council and between us and Natural England where we've been kicking various things around. We have visited all the sites with Natural England, uh, and in principle, they have agreed that, that they could be delivered. Um, the fifth point was with regard to the... Um, location of uh, Sang for the Royal School. Just, just one point to note there is that what we have agreed with Sang, uh, what we have agreed with Natural England elsewhere, around Thames Basin Heaths, and they're also discussing it with around Wealdon Heaths in East Hampshire uh, and in other European sites, is that um, the Sang does not necessarily have to be literally on the site of the development. So it needs to be within the five kilometer catchment. But if you can deliver a sign that is somewhere else, but, but absorbs visitors so that the overall increase in visitor pressure is offset, Natural England have found that to be an acceptable solution. And, and in fact, that is how I mentioned Surrey Heath and other authorities than Tens Basin Heath. That is how some of the more constrained authorities in that area are looking to uh, and have agreed to alleviate the issue. So, so it, just bear in mind, it does not necessarily have to be the case that, although that is the preference, that the sang is literally delivered on the same site as the allocation. Um, and my final point, um, 
um, point six numbers changed. I can't remember what I was going to say in my final point. So if I remember, I'll come back to it. But I think those are the five. Uh, oh, um, no, it's, it's OK. I think I've already effectively addressed the, the, the five main points I was going to make. Thank you. Mr. Ellis. Yes, uh, Dr. Riley just mentioned something about the, the, the block on delivery um, that uh, Mr. Kite was uh, alluding to. Um, I mean, in, in, our, in our response to your preliminary uh, matters, we set out the anticipated rates of delivery for some of the sites um, in Hazemere. And I know that's something that you've asked us to look at in terms of actually putting that forward in, in the policy as a main modification, and we will do so. And I don't want to get into too much detail about some of the matter seven um, issues that, that are coming up next week, but um, many of the allocations that we've got in the plan uh, do look to delivery towards the latter part of the plan period, um, as we've already suggested in our in our preliminary matters, and as such, that will give us time to to find mitigation solution for those for those sites. I unfortunately I don't know enough about the planning application at, at the old Grove, um, but I do believe that was for um, eighteen dwellings. Um, but I thought that was under the number that actually at the moment Natural England were were looking for specific mitigation measures for, but I can't give you any more detail on 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 that. Uh, just as one more point, um, Kyle was obviously talking about the change in the numbers for Hazemere um, overall, um, but the change to the numbers for Hazemere overall is actually from the pre-submission plan that we consulted on uh, back in November 2020. The actual change has been relatively small um, and I appreciate that some sites may have, may have come slightly under the threshold where certain types of mitigation are, but the advice from Natural England is that anything over 20 should have some form of mitigation, but I do appreciate that sites that are over 50, they were revising SANG as a solution. I've just remembered that that was the that was my final comment that I was going to observe, which is about the, the reference to the change in numbers. And I, I did allude to it earlier, and I also mentioned it on Tuesday, but bearing in mind in combination, as Mr. Kite correctly mentioned, that involves East Hampshire and the overwhelming bulk of growth within five kilometres of Tennis Basin Heath remains a Whitehill border in East Hampshire and the growth that is happening in East Hampshire. Within that context, while differences in thresholds may mean that, that some sites fall out of them having to give mitigation and others don't, it, it remains the fact that by my calculations so by 80 to 90 percent depending on how you calculated of growth within five kilometers of wheel and heath phase two would be mitigated when you take into account east hampshire as well as waverley anything further to add mr Kane? just very briefly if i may sir um Firstly, uh, Dr. Riley correctly says that um, the favourable conservation status of, 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 the, of the qualifying features of the SBA is looked at uh, across the site as a whole. That's, that's, of course, correct. But it is possible to have an adverse effect on the integrity of uh, the site by undermining its qualifying features in one small area or one small part. I don't have the references to hand immediately, sir, but there is... Um, relevant case law in the Court of Justice of the European Union that pertains to, I think, a, um, a project in, in Ireland that was affecting a very small area of hen harrier habitat um, in an SPA um, that, that, that arrived at that conclusion. Um, in terms of the change in position for mitigation requirement, um, I think I just have to disagree with, uh, agree to disagree with Dr. Riley on that. That's, that isn't my reading of, of the documents. So I'm content to leave that um, for you to reach a, a, a judgment on your, yourself, sir. Um, in terms of delays, I, I also agree with Dr. Riley that they're the nature of the beast, but that, of course, doesn't mean that um, the council either couldn't or, or, or shouldn't um, take action to, to, to minimise and overcome the potential for delays, which I think is the point that I'm that, that I'm making. Um, if if it's the council's position that um, it's their primary intention that developers will bring forward their own SANG, um, uh, and therefore it would have been um, perverse for the council to look into alternatives. Um, the first point I'd make is that I can't, I find it difficult, that difficult to square with paragraph 3.15 and 4.4 
of the HRA of LPP2, which does in fact state, as I, as I said previously, that further work would be done before the examination. Um, but, but the other point, I suppose, is that there isn't any reason, if that was the case, why the site allocations shouldn't be examined in themselves to, to, so that the council could satisfy itself that a sound was deliverable within the site boundary. Um, um, I agree that Sang, I agree with Dr. Riley that Sang doesn't have to be within the site boundary itself. It can, it can be on an adjacent site or a site nearby. But, but again, I'd make the point that I don't believe uh, such a site has been identified specifically in respect of the Royal School. Uh, and just very, and just finally, so on the Old Grove um, site, um, the, the council are correct. I've, I, I have Natural England's objection letter here, and I'm happy to make that, that available if that would assist. It was for 18 dwellings, but I think the point that Natural England have made in their objection is that it's 18 dwellings added on to a C2 care home, uh, the combination of which would result in the site having over 20 net additional dwellings, and that it, it is also the first 20 dwellings of a 40 dwelling emerging allocation in, in Waverley lo local, local plan. So I think the point that they were making is that um, they're keen to avoid sites being salami sliced so that they fall below the mitigation trigger thresholds and therefore escape mitigation so that the, the, the proponents of those sites can't then come back and put in another sub threshold allocation, um, at, which would of course result in uh, gradually in an in combination impact on the SPA because, because of those sites escaping mitigation. That, that appears to be the point they're making in their objection letter and I can make that available, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Any um, responses? Just a couple of brief points. Um, it is, of course, absolutely true that, that, that you can have an adverse effect on the trajectory of the site by affecting one particular part of the site. You don't have to affect the whole site. Uh, but that is obviously why the mitigation strategy uh, approach is applied throughout the five kilometre zone around all parcels of the European site. Um, and uh, in our numerous discussions, just for, for information, our numerous discussions with Natural England over the past year or so about this, um, they have continued to, to, to make it clear, as I think we do reflect in the HRA reports, that they, you know, this is very much about future proofing, if you like, and they are content that at the moment the bird populations of the site are, are not suffering in the way that they, the, you know, even though there are areas that certainly are under significant pressure and therefore need management, they are not suffering to the way that the, the, the uh, Thames Basin Lease and other sites are, and this is about ensuring they don't in the future. Um, the second and final point I just wanted to say was just, just for clarification, um, I didn't say it would be perverse to look into bringing sites forward. I said it would be perverse for the council to have sites ready to go. Obviously, they are looking into them. They have been looking into them, and there's a time scale for that. Um, but obviously, if, if that is, you know, if, if their preferred solution is for developers to bring forward their own sites, then it would, you know, there's no point in them having their own sites at the council ready to launch. But obviously, it's not perverse to look into them, which is what they have been doing. It's very sensible. Um, just to clarify, where I say, where we say in the HRA, further work should be done with regard to Sang for Royal School in advance of local plan part two. Obviously, it will make everything easier if the if the developer for Royal School had had done that, and we could say now here they've got a sank they've got it brought forward um but but the point i was making right at the start where i where i quoted um that case and 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 the what i said in response to that case was that there's a difference between that being desirable and preferable and that being this necessary both legally and in terms of you of you being able to find the plan sound um and just for clarity, it was the developer who I was suggesting should do the further work rather than the council, because obviously it's the developer's mitigation solution. But that's just for information. I mean, the basic point remains for me, there is no reason to believe that it will be impossible to deliver a Sanger Hazelmore during the remaining years of the plan period. And the fact that a land parcel hasn't actually been identified and allocated in the plan doesn't mean the site is not protected and doesn't mean an allocation cannot be made. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a note, we'll be hearing from the Royal School next week when we talk about the site allocations in more detail. So no doubt that point about the on-site sang will, will come up again there. But Mr Ellis, sorry. Uh, it, it was only, it's just a very small point. Um, so and I don't really want to labour the point. Um, as I say, the, um, I've seen the... Um, the comments from Natural England in regard to the old grove, and I think that just um, basically demonstrates that that um, the concerns about um, mitigation 
you know, do not significantly delay the delivery of, of, of sites, their, their objection seems to appear because um, the application in combination, um, the application on the old grove in combination with the allocation for a 22 additional dwellings would obviously require mitigation. Um, and they're, they're obviously looking at that, but the, the old grove has um, anticipated for delivery in the latter years of the plan and um, should not um, affect its delivery as anticipated. So going back to the, the Natural England uh, statement of common ground, so it picks up um, some wording in the HRA refer that it suggests should be changed. Is, is this something that's picked up in the consolidated version? Yes, that was an easy answer, yes. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Cat, is there anything further on this point before we move to issue two? Nothing further, sir. Okay, so moving on to issue two. So could you talk me through the uh, main modifications that have been proposed um, to the policy DM1 um, and how these would address any soundness concerns, please? Yes, uh, so um, we're proposing a number of um, modifications to to policy DM1, which is environmental implications of of development. And as as I said in my introduction, um, the bio, biodiversity is obviously a very important component of this policy. But it it does look um, at um, all aspects of environmental um, impacts rather than just um, impact on biodiversity. However, um, taking the light of the, um, the mitigation hierarchy set out in the MPPF, we are proposing a change to DM1A um, to reflect the HIP mitigation hierarchy as set out in the MPPF. Um, but there's also a consequent change to D, DM1H, which is under MM39, which removes that. So basically it's effectively moving H into A um, and amending the wording to reflect the MPPF for consistency. The other change is MM47, which reflects the MPPF's um, approach to the impact of light pollution on biodiversity and adding additional wording in there to reflect that. And also within, sorry, that's within DM1G, but also to reflect the minimum biodiversity net gain from the provisions of the Environment Act of 10%. So they're the two which make up MM47. So 
question in terms of uh, main modification three. So this is to policy DM one A. So this is where it says where adverse environmental impacts are unavoidable and the benefits of the development demonstrably outweigh the harm ensure impacts are appropriately mitigated or as a last result compensated for. So if we look at the framework, we take up the framework, uh, paragraph 180. So it, particularly 180A, so that talks about significant harm to biodiversity. So the, so, so the way that the, the main modification runs now seems to be perhaps a, a more stringent sort of test where it refers to adverse environmental impacts. You got any views on that, Mr. Ellis? So the, the reason why it's, um, <laughs> there's no adjective um, they're used is so that it's more in line with, with other policies, particularly DM5 um, of, of local plan part two, which um, relates to the amenity and occupants of near, nearby buildings. This, the intention of DM1A, as I said, was never to specifically relate to impacts on biodiversity, but in general impacts on the environment. So it has been um, has been worded to to align with that. However, I do take the point that um, um, other policies in the plan use an adjective, whether it's substantial or, sig or significant. So the council would be happy to look again to see whether a more appropriate uh, wording could be used, as I say, than an adjective to to go in in there. Yeah, I think it'd be useful in terms of looking at it um, insofar as a, is it, whether it's consistent with the framework and, and how whether any further changes are necessary to make it consistent. Mr. Kite, did you have any views on, on the modifications proposed? Did you, I think in your statement, you had some suggestion. I, I don't have anything further to add to um, our statement. So it was, it was simply that um, in my view that, that the wording of uh, policy DM1 part G could, could there, was, there, was, there were several changes that could be usefully made to bring it more into line with um, paragraph 180A, as you've already identified in the NPPF, specifically to reflect, my point was specifically so that it reflects the mitigation hierarchy of avoiding impacts first, mitigating if it can't, can't be avoided, compensating as a last resort, and then adding enhancements and net gain on top of that. That was my, my point, sir. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, if, if you could revisit the modification um, with those uh, considerations in line. Yes, sir, thank you. So that, that concludes the questions I have on this matter. Mr. Kite, any further points you'd like to raise at this juncture? Nothing from me, sir. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you for your contributions this morning. Um, so that concludes the, the discussion of this matter. Um, we'll just uh, take a short break uh, to about quarter to 11, then come back and do our um, action points session for the day. Thank you.
Okay, if we um, just run through the, the actions. So the first one I, I had was the court judgment that was referred to by Dr. Riley yes. to be added to the library. Second was to consider um, how the mitigation options could be reflected in the plan, as, as you said, Mr. Beglin, through that lens of pre-application. Effective pre-application engagement. Um, so the third one that we had down was to look at DM1 again in relation to uh, consistency with the MPPF. Yes. Uh, I've checked with Miss Knowles and I think those were the three on our list. Yeah, that's the three on my list as well. So that's good. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for all your contributions this week um, and um, see you again on, at 9.30 on Monday. See you then, sir. So just as a matter of housekeeping that um, follows on from, I think it was Tuesday's uh, mopping up session um, where the office, uh, where Waverley's officers um, said that there would be a further uh, appropriate assessment uh, uh, being produced and that it would be put up on Waverley's website. Uh, during the day it had been clarified, I think this, this, the starting position was that an updated um, uh, Habitats Regulation Assessment for Appropriate Assessment was going to be produced, that's what was in the answers to the MIQ, to, to your MIQs originally. Um, and then uh, that became during the day, I think Dr. Riley had, uh, had said that, well, there wasn't going to be much new in there, but it was uh, an update and it would effectively uh, um, uh, put the uh, put all of the information together because there obviously there's HRAs two or two or three of them from LPP one and then another two from LPP two and it shouldn't be a paper chase um, and and just as a matter of um, uh, voicing public concern and uh, and the, the public's rights to participation which is explained in People Over Win paragraph thirty nine I'm sure you're aware of Aarhus. Um, I want to know, are we going to get that? Is it going to be consulted upon? Um, and, and in particular, of course, the National Planning, Planning Policy Guidance on Appropriate Assessment from 2019, which states competent authorities must now assess the robustness of mitigation measures through an appropriate assessment. Um, we haven't seen that. That needs to come in front of the residents for um to be able to scrutinize it see if it withstands scrutiny there never has yet been a complete appropriate assessment of the effectiveness of sangs so can we can you explain to us are we going to get that uh, and are we going is it going to be consulted upon or are we going to rely on september additional sessions to be able to mop up that sort of thing yeah. where are we with it well, well as i understand it the habitats regulation assessment is a consolidated consolidated version of the things that have been pre uh, prepared thus far and that's ready to go more or less isn't it yes sir, that's absolutely correct um as dr riley explained on um on tuesday and i think he referred again today that the consolidated document is 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 one that basically puts all together the the two habitats regulations assessments that were set out for the original pre-submission uh, version of the plan that we consulted on um, between November and January, sorry, November 2020 and January 2021, and then the subsequent uh, consultation on the addendum to the pre-submission um, at the end of last year, and that just brings the, the document or the information together. There's no new technical analysis or anything with it, but it will include the, the uh, work that was undertaken um on the impact on the european sites from on air quality so that work will also be included but there's no there's no new information with regard to that that would go in there and as such it will be um added to the examination library as soon as it's as soon as it's completed which should be very soon sir okay and then there'd be a further habitats regulation assessment of any main modifications that will be consulted on in the normal way yes so that would well that would be the intention um to the obviously to the modifications that we're, we're undertaking and the finishing 
of the, of the hearings, um, further evidence gathering will be taking place with regard to any, any changes that we propose, and that should include a, an updated habitats regulation assessment for, for that version of the plan that we were suggesting should be modified by. Okay, so if that if that consolidated version could be provided as soon as possible, then I'll take a, a view on whether additional sessions are needed to discuss that in particular. I, I think if we it would probably save time if we have clarification right now from officers that um, I think what we've just heard is that um, there is no intention to provide any assessment of the effectiveness of the extent to which mitigation is effective, whether it be HIPs, SANG or SAM. Um, and as there's no uh, intention of producing that, quite clearly there's no intention of complying with uh, uh, National Planning Practice Guidance on AA at 65 For, Forgive me, that this is a substantive discussion. We've already had a substantive well, discussion on... So we don't move on Don't talk over it. me, please. We've already had a substantive discussion, firstly on the legal compliance, which I did, which you didn't appear at. Uh, and we've had a biodiversity session this morning, again, which you, you haven't indicated that you'd appear at. Um, as I've said, I've minded once we've got the, once we've got the document, uh, there might be, we've, we've got some contingency sessions, not only in September, but next week, um, where we might be able to discuss it in more detail. There's another, iteration of the HRA of any main modifications which include this approach to mitigation. So I, th I think at this stage, that's as, as far as we'll, we'll go. Okay, thank you. That's clear. Views? Uh, so no, nothing further to add from us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So in, as I said, we'll, uh, we'll reconvene at half past nine on Monday. Thank you.